Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining the combustion webinar. This is Wang Han. It's, our, it's my great pleasure to introduce our, uh, our today's speaker, Professor Christian Hasa. So Professor Hasa is the head of the Institute for the Simulation of Reactive Thermal Fluid System at TU Darmstadt in Germany. From 2010 to 2017, he was full professor at TU Freiburg in Germany. From 2004 to uh, 2010, he worked at BMW in engine development and exhaust after treatment. He received his PhD degree at Aachen University in 2004, supervised by uh, Professor Norbert Peters. His main research area are combustion zero modeling and simulation with application to technical system, such as IC engine, aero engine, furnace, and the reactor in process engineering. He has published over 118 peer-reviewed papers. He was elected a fellow of the International Combustion Institute for his contribution to turbulent combustion, solid fuel combustion, multi-phase flow, and the suit formation. Professor Hassa will cover the, the numerical and the experimental study collaboration at Tew Darmstadt in this talk. Okay, Professor Hassa, you can start. All right, uh, Wang, thank you very much for this kind of introduction. Let me share my screen. And uh, thanks, um, thanks again for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to give a, a presentation here. When I was thinking about the topic, uh, several options came to my mind. Uh, soot formation, solid fuel combustion, including iron, uh, flamelet modeling, turbulent flames. But then I thought maybe I can choose something that is uh, interesting to a large part of our uh, scientific community. And uh, one thing we worked on in the last couple of years quite a bit is, is multi-regime combustion. So uh, that's the first part of the, uh, of the title here. Now, the second thing is um, I wanted in talking about the methods, I thought maybe it's interesting, uh, maybe I can make it interesting for colleagues uh, working both in experiments and uh, simulation and keeping in mind that my expertise is in simulation. Um, I was thinking that, uh, as, as Wang just said, uh, Theo Darmstadt is a, a characteristic uh, in Theo Darmstadt is that we have a very close collaboration between experiments and simulation. And in fact, long before I joined Theo Darmstadt, um, I've heard people talking about uh, the Darmstadt model referring to this particular situation. So what I want to share is, is some of our recent uh, works and experiences um, where we try to fully leverage the potential of this close collaboration and develop methods that are really a combination of both approaches. So that's the second part of my um, uh, talk, here, uh, second part of the title here. Uh, before I start, I, I'd like to acknowledge all the contributions uh, from uh, postdocs and uh, PhD students um, that uh, directly went into this uh, presentation. I'm really privileged to work uh, with many uh, such uh, many uh, young and, and brilliant people. And I'd also like to mention all these collaborations on this particular topic we had over the last couple of years. And you see uh, many friends and colleagues mentioned here. So uh, let me get uh, right into uh, the topic, uh, while I obviously do not have to convince this uh, community and this audience that combustion technologies will remain important. So um, the, the question is, what are our challenges uh, when it comes uh, to new combustion technologies? So there's always the, uh, the everlasting thing of increasing efficiency and reduction of emissions. But, but what's really challenging us at the moment is that we have a lot of new fuels and especially hydrogen and ammonia uh, which can be mixed, which can be added to other fuels. And if you look closely, it's really that ammonia and hydrogen have very complex multi regime multi-mode combustion characteristics. And we want to understand how these turbulent flames or laminar turbulent flames look like, we really need a very close interplay of experiments and simulations. How do we usually do this? We look at complex applications. And here are just two examples, a gas turbine combustor and an IC engine. Uh, we see complex combustion phenomena and we derive benchmark flames from this, where you can investigate these physical and chemical processes and all the details. Here are shown the experiments. And then uh, we go uh, towards combustion modeling, uh, where we use this data to better understand the physics, to develop models and to validate the models against the experimental data. And with these models, you can go back to the complex application and use a validated model to do this. 
Now, when I talk about multi-regime or multi-mode combustion, uh, how do we classify combustion processes? And this is what we usually do in a combustion one uh, class for our students is that we say we have, for example, premixed and non-premixed flames. Here, um, fresh reactants in a burn stabilized flame and you have a laminar burning velocity. For the non-premixed flames, you have fuel and oxidizer in a counterflow configuration. If you would now plot uh, temperature over mixture fraction or equivalence ratio you would get for this plot here, you would basically get for a constant mixture fraction or equivalence ratio, you see reactions taking place, temperature is increasing. And if you would simulate this uh, you, along this line and you would plot this, you would get the same line here, hopefully matching with the experimental data. Same thing for the counterflow flame, you would get a typical uh, diffusion flame profile where you have mixing on either side of the reaction zone reaction zone being close to stoichiometric mixture um, with the highest temperature. And again, if you plot this, you should get basically the same uh, figure from simulation. Now, looking at um, a classification we established a couple of years back at the TNF workshop is uh, in looking here at the combustion mode, going from premix to non-premix with stratified Apache premix in between, a regime here referring to the Reynolds, Dumpkiller, and Kalowitz numbers, you see the wide range of benchmark flames that were developed over the last couple of years. And many of them are really in between the asymptotic limits that we had before. So the, um, what we have is in the technical combustion application, and also in these benchmark flames, we have fairly complex flow and mixing patterns and flame structures. And uh, obviously we have something uh, which I call multi-regime or multi-mode combustion. And what I mean by this is that the local reaction zone can combine characteristics of both premixed and non-premixed flames. I'd like to mention that the, the terminology and uh, the nomenclature used here in the literature is slightly varying. There's, there's no unique terminology here and different conventions can be found in the literature. For example, Assad in his uh, review paper at the 35th Combustion Symposium said that the term partially premixed refers uh, to situations where the fluid partially is compositionally inhomogeneous, mixing continues to occur in this parcel, and we have diffusion-like reaction zones as well as premixed propagating layers that may exist in very close proximity. So basically saying the same thing as I said above here, combining combinations of premixed and non-premixed flames in close proximity. And this is really how I look at this uh, during, the, during this talk. And looking at two benchmark flames we have in the literature here is that uh, from the TNF workshop, the first one was the Sydney uh, Sandia burner with inhomogeneous inlets. And the second one is the Darmstadt burner. If you uh, look at the plot again, temperature of a mixture fraction, you see here the what we call multi-regime characteristics. Uh, neither uh, something that is a purely premixed or non-premixed flame, so something in between where you have mixing and reaction uh, taking place. What we also know from these flames is that these multi-regime combustion affects both flame stability and the flame structure, and that again influences pollutant emissions. All of this is very challenging from combustion um, uh, modeling people like I am. Another example is a gas turbine combustor, and again, uh, going the, uh, from a technical application to uh, a benchmark uh, combustor uh, uh, reference system here, the DLR Stuttgart burner as well stabilized flame, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, and you do here uh, look at Raman measurements from this particular system, and you see here also a, a lot of different uh, regions covered. And again, this is, um, uh, indicates that uh, multi regime characteristics uh, will be in this particular system. Now, when we talk about the modeling of such flames, and this is here the Darmstadt burner, um, we should predict the what we call sometimes the macroscopic and the microscopic flame structure. What do I mean by this? So the macroscopic flame structure are typical things, more global quantities like the, the burning velocity, the flame angle, the flame length, flame stabilization, and ignition delay. On the other hand, what um, I refer to when I say the microscopic flame structure, it's really the reaction zone structure. So uh, a fine scale structure here and the local combustion regime. And that basically drills down to the interaction of transport and reactions on the fine on the small scales. And when we talk about multi-regime and multi-regime detection, it's really that we try to understand the microscopic flame structure in such a complex system. And the question is, 
How do I determine now the local combustion regime or mode in such a flame? Now, obviously, this is a topic of great interest, and many people have worked on this. And here are some examples for regime or mode indicators that you find in the literature. Most prominently, the flame index, which is cross-scalar dissipation of fuel and oxidizer, that is uh, shown here. Uh, you find normalized variants, uh, variants of this flame index, improved versions for partially premixed combustion, a combustion regime indicator, and all of this is discussed in uh, three uh, papers that I reference here, uh, where you find a lot of details in this. Well, looking at these uh, first six papers and looking at the authors, you might have uh, figured, seen that these are mostly uh, people working in, in simulation and modeling. And that's, uh, in fact, also um, reflected in all of these regime indicators rely on 3D scalar gradients. And that means we require detailed fine scale information including gradients locally and not just from a single scalar. And as Rob Barlow put out in 2015, pretty um, um, said pretty clear is that current experimental techniques cannot access this level of quantitative detail, meaning uh, 3D gradients of multiple scalars. So um, this is a challenge we have. Now let's look at some examples for the state of the art in turbulent flames. And I'll just give you two examples here. So diagnostics uh, for spray flames and uh, Raman Rayleigh in turbulent gas flames. So what, what we can achieve in, um, in turbulent flames. Let's look at um, a spray flame from the ECN workshop. So uh, very similar to the TNF, but uh, more related to uh, combustion in, uh, in or internal combustion engines. And here specifically looking at spray flames, it's a high pressure spray flame, in this particular case, spray A, for those of you who know this, it's an endo decay spray, oxygen depleted atmosphere. And uh, we look at this in a constant volume chamber. And uh, here's a selection of measurement techniques that you find here. It's me scattering, Schlieren, OH star chemiluminescence, OH plif, formaldehyde plif, PAH plif, and a soot luminosity. Um, these Techniques are not quantitative per se. They don't give you uh, a temperature directly, but you need post-processing to achieve the quantities that we usually solve for in a CFD. That is slightly different in if you have Raman Rayleigh available uh, for, for turbulent gas flame, for example, where you measure in the best case along one line, uh, the temperature and the Raman species, so major species, it's simultaneous and uh, quantitative information that you get on these scalars that you might get uh, distributions like you see them here along um, this line. However, still you don't have minor species or radicals and you don't have 2D or 3D information directly. And going to more complex environments like particle laying flows or sooting flames um, is, is very challenging uh, for this technique. So in summary, even here, which you can, could consider the gold standard, um, uh, for such flames, you don't have direct information on the combustion regime and mode from experiments. So what you really need is a combined inference from experiments in simulation to achieve uh, this um, to the, achieve this goal. And I put this down here as a question. So what's our current approach usually? Now, assume you want to look at the, some uh, at a certain flame, and you're uh, an experimentalist. You have a flame, and you would choose your diagnostics. Uh, you run your experiment, get your signal. You perform post-processing and averaging, and you end up with temperature and species. On the other hand, being a, a simulation person, you would have to solve, uh, you have to select your models for irradiation, chemistry, turbulence, chemistry, action, and so on and so on. You have to choose your numerics, uh, discretization, mesh size, time step, et cetera, PP. All of this has to be um, combined in, in a code, and you perform your LES. You average your result and you end up with something that you can combine. And then in, you might uh, end up with a good agreement between here experiment and simulation showing here from uh, one particular flame uh, a temperature profile. So this is what we usually do. So looking at multi-regime flames, the question really is, um, what is the best way to compare this, especially if you have non-quantitative experimental data, and how do you compare this to the numerical data? So that's my question one. And the question one, that's two is, how can we determine the combustion regime or mode from the local thermochemical state, either from experiment or simulation? So these are sort of the two guiding questions that I have here. And um, that brings me uh, finally to the outline, what I want to cover with you in the next uh, minutes. 
is I want to talk about what I call computing the signal. So what I actually do is I compute the experimental signal in CFD. I perform a numerical experiment and uh, I integrate the signal as a, as a scalar in my CFD and I apply the same averaging techniques that um, I do with like I do with uh, do it for other scalars. The second thing is I want to do what I call computing on the signal. So I want to combine experimental data and modeling assumptions and come to what we call a prior analysis. And I'll explain that uh, in a couple of minutes. And I want to go beyond what the experimental data gives me directly. And I want to um, use this data and go a little bit further and determine the local combustion mode and regime. Basically, actually, we can do this both in experimental and numerical data. And um, I'll introduce what we call a gradient-free regime identification. And finally, I would like to close with three examples from LES applications. Um, where we look again at this uh, multi-regime burner, uh, a gas turbine combustor in a high pressure spray flame uh, going from simple to complex in terms of the uh, physical processes that we had to worry about. And the other uh, thing that you have to uh, consider here is that quantitative diagnostics um, or the diagnostics become more quantitative as you go in this direction. So let's start with computing the signal. And um, this is obviously something that people have been done, have been doing for a long, long time. And uh, one example here comes from 1999, uh, where um, it was introduced as, of comp as computational flow imaging. And what was done here in a, um, in, in a flow with a shock, uh, it was, uh, they used a PLEF of NO in this hypersonic flow. And then in the end, they, ex um, they introduced the same signal in the simulation, and then they could compare simulation and experiment directly. <clears throat> about 10 years later, we had this paper from, from Yale, uh, where they actually talked about a paradigm shift, and um, they um, applied this procedure of uh, computing the signal um, with various advantages, which you see a couple of them here for uh, sooting flames and uh, particularly they looked at NO lift. And here's one example from their paper. Uh, you see a laminar flame. We have the computed NO signal and the measured NO in PPM, but obviously they did not measure the NO directly, but they, what they actually did, it, did measure is NO lift. And then uh, you see here on the right side, the direct comparison of the NO lift signal with the computed NO lift signal. And um, there, there's a lot of discussion why that has a lot of advantages, uh, in, especially in challenging environments. What I want to do is about, again, about 10 years later, uh, give you three of our application examples. Um, as you see here, it's a spray flame, uh, a jet flame, and flame wall interaction. Now let's start with the uh, spray flame here. And again, I'll, I'll refer to the ECN, the engine combustion network. Uh, it's the spray A. And um, we have here uh, the Schlieren setup uh, from the University in Valencia. And we said um, one, one very important diagnostic technique in the ECN is uh, the Schlieren, Schlieren imaging. And now we introduced the Schlieren imaging in our simulations as well. And then uh, we looked at the, the Schlieren signals. Now let's look first at the experiment and you see here um, the spray A and how it looks like. And you see here that obviously there's combustion happening. So all the ignition, uh, it gets a little lighter and then it gets uh, darker again. And these are uh, in fact three uh, particular phases you see always in these Schlieren imaging. You see the propagation of the flame, the softening, and again, the reappearing of the signal. Do we see the same thing in the simulation? Um, let's look at this. Um, so this is a computed Schlieren signal for the same case. You see this uh, propagation, the softening, and the reappearing in the Schlieren signal. So overall, that gives me uh, a first indication that qualitatively, we get a very similar result as in the experiment. And that, in the end, gives us insights into this complex mixture formation and ignition processes that have, are happening in these high pressure spray flames. Now, uh, looking a little bit more in detail, this uh, propagation softening and reappearing from the computed Schlieren signal, um, as we saw it before for the experimental Schlieren signal, you see again the same three phases in here. 
So obviously, the, uh, this comparison is favorable, looks quite good, and can, be, can serve as a push validation of the simulation approach. Second thing we also learned from these ECN sprays is um, when you have a, a lift signal excited at uh, 355 um, nanometers, uh, the first thing you usually look for is formaldehyde. And formaldehyde obviously is important uh, for the ignition processes. And again, here you see the experimental signal for formaldehyde. And down here you see the computed signal. So it's a computed formaldehyde lift signal, which we introduced in our LES. And you can already uh, see that this has um, quite similar structures and uh, at least appears at the same places. Later on, when you start to form uh, PAHs, you see in the experiment a second signal because you do not only excite the, uh, the, the, the formaldehyde, but you also excite PAHs. And again, here you can use the simulation to distinguish between the two signals. And this is what you see here at the bottom. You see the, the formaldehyde lift signal, and you also see where PAH is formed in the simulation. That is, again, very consistent to what we see here in the experiment. So really, you can, um, you can use the, um, the simulation to distinguish between uh, the different species that are responsible for the lift signal that you get. So that was my first example. I'll, I'll shift gears a little, go to a turbulent uh, DME flame. And this is again uh, a TNF workshop uh, benchmark flame. It's uh, very similar to uh, what you know from the Sydney Sandia piloted jet burner uh, flame series. Uh, it's a very established canonical configuration. It was, uh, there are probably hundreds of paper looking at this uh, for methane. And then recently they introduced a DME as a first renewable fuel, which is also quite uh, challenging for the diagnostics. And um, for this particular flame, we had a wide range of experimental data. It's Raman Rayleigh CO lift, as well as um, the velocity field as, and formaldehyde in OH lift. And this is uh, what I'm going to look at in, in more detail here, the, these two signals. What they found in the experiment, and you see here in blue, the OH lift signal and the, um, in red, the formaldehyde lift signal is that they were separated. This was one thing and that the separation between these two regions are actually growing as you go further downstream. And there was no direct explanation why that happens. Now, the simulation, when we introduced the OH lift and the formaldehyde lift signal in the simulation, actually showed the same thing. Obviously, we could not explain it directly, but um, we, first of all, it was good to see that we see the same gap forming in the simulation. And then we could go a little further and look in flamelet space, what happens actually is if you plot flamelet solutions, uh, non-premix flamelet solutions for different scalar dissipation rates, so mixing rates, you could say, is that you see, and you see them here. So in black, you see the OH over mixture fraction, and in red, you see the formaldehyde over mixture fraction. And as the, um, the scalar dissipation rate decreases, you see that the formaldehyde actually goes more towards the rich side, and this gap already forms in mixture fraction space. So the, the explanation here was that as the scalar dissipation rate drops, you see uh, this separation taking place in mixture fraction space. And as you know, is that the mixing rate and the scalar dissipation rate will drop as you go down in a jet flame. So here, by looking at the computed signals, we could first validate our approach and then second, go into the details of the numerical simulation to explain this gap formation, which is important for the dynamics of this flame. As I will show you here, this is a simulation where you see these computed signals, the dynamics of these computed signals over time. And um, you see this uh, closer to the nozzle in the, in the lower plot. And in the upper one, you see um, further downstream. And you really see a couple of things. The dynamics of the formaldehyde, uh, when it interacts with the OH, it's obviously oxidized, it, it vanishes. But then you also see these larger regions these gaps and pockets appearing. So it's very valuable <clears throat> to have 2D diagnostics here um, because you can learn a lot about the dynamics and then combining it with the simulation uh, gives you uh, a nice insight into the flame properties. Third example I'd like to briefly touch is premix flame wall interaction. And again, I want to look at simultaneous from aldehyde OH lift. Now, flame wall interaction is something um, in Darmstadt that is also very important for us. 
Um, we have many projects on this. And here again, you want to look at the gas turbine or the, um, uh, the IC engine. And again, we derived from this in Andreas Streitzel's group, they derived a, a benchmark flame, which is called a, a sidewall quenching burner, where you have a pre-mixed mixture flowing in here. You, have, you stabilize the flame here at a ceramic uh, rod, and um, you have two branches of this flame, the left one here interacting with the temperature controlled wall, and the right one, which is a freely propagating flame. Now, they introduced laser sheets for formaldehyde and OH lift. Um, took that on two different cameras. And what, uh, why would you do this? Because as you know, in premix flames, the correlation between formaldehyde and OH is a good indicator for the heat release rate. Looking at a uh, premix flame here, unburned to burned, looking at typical profiles, you see the temperature increasing, the OH and the formaldehyde. Now with the typical um, regions in such a flame, the zones with unburned preheat reactions on the burned gas. Now, if you plot the, from aldehyde times OH, you get a profile like this. And you, if you superimpose the heat release rate on this, you see that these profiles are very similar. So from aldehyde times OH concentration is a good indicator for the profile of the heat release rate. And what they found in the experiment was something very interesting. You see here the from aldehyde profile, you see the OH profile, you do the, uh, then you multiply them with each other. And you see here in this curved flame, that in the negatively curved region, the flame propagates in this direction, you see here an increase in the heat release rate. And if you have something like this in a negatively curved region, increase in heat release rate, this is an effect of differential diffusion, as you know, and um, because you have uh, accumulation here uh, in, in this particular part, which uh, accelerates the flame. Now, the question was, if you have this very close to the wall, is this, this um, a uh, product of formaldehyde and OH is still a good indicator for the heat release rate because you lose a lot of um, a lot of heat. And that, again, what we did is we computed uh, for the uh, resolving uh, such a flame, we computed this DME flame. Again, you see here the, the, the flame stabilization, the freely propagating uh, branch and the one interacting with the flame. Looking a little bit closer here at the heat release rate at the wall, you can already see a little bit that there's a lot of change in the heat release rate. And um, then we did the statistics of this. And here you see the curvature and the heat release rate. And again, you see a very clear trend that heat release rate, even close to the wall, increases with uh, negative uh, curvature. And then we looked a little closer in the simulation and uh, looked at the heat release rate here at close to the wall. And then you see here the computed lift signal. So computer lift signals in this uh, simulation of formaldehyde and OH. And looking a little bit closer, you see the same thing that in these regions of negative curvature, you have an increase in the heating, uh, heat release rate and um, a decrease in this positively curved region. So in fact, here we, we learn two things. First of all, differential diffusion is very important near the wall and that the simulation confirmed that the formaldehyde times OH signal is still a very valid marker for heat release in the near wall region. I would like to close this part with uh, a, a reference list. Obviously, computed signals is, is nothing new, and uh, you, you find a lot of uh, studies in the literature, and this is just a non-exhaustive list, but if you want to um, look a little bit closer. These are good uh, papers to start out with. Now, I want to sum that up again. Uh, we have our flame set up and being a, a, as an experimentalist, you would choose your diagnostics and you get the experimental signal. On the simulation side, you choose your models, your numerics, but you also compute a signal, an experimental signal. You do put this in the LES and averaging and what you end up basically is a comparison between the numerical and the real experiment. Um, as you see it up here, uh, that's for uh, a Rayleigh signal in the flame, which I hadn't, didn't have time uh, to cover today. So obviously what, what I want to make my point here is that the known thermochemical state in simulation helps me here to compute the experimental signal. Um, and uh, several papers showed we have a reduced uncertainty in post-processing, especially in challenging environments. Uh, Oxyfuel and sooting flames are just two to name. Um, what we can really use then is the simultaneous non-quantitative measurement where we get 2D data, maybe even high speed, 
and uh, learn something about the flame and you can use the computed signals to go into all the details. What's the temperature? What's the uh, fuel mass fraction, for example? So overall, I think we can, what we can reach here is an improved comparison of um, experiment and simulation. And that again, uh, gives us a lot of opportunities for model development and validation. Now, after having talked about computing the experimental signal, I wanna uh, shift gears again a little bit and talk about how do I compute something on the signal? And before I do this, I actually have to do a, a very brief description and presentation how our LES uh, modeling framework uh, is, is working. Uh, because uh, really just in a nutshell, because um, this will be uh, important to understand and to uh, see how our prior analysis works. So let me start out with how do we usually validate numerical combustion models uh, based on experimental data? And you see here again, uh, a jet flame experiment and simulation. What we can do is a structural analysis of the experimental data where you see the temperature here, the Bilger mixture fraction, or uh, the methane mass fraction, and you, you can com uh, obviously compare these conditional uh, statistics. You can also compare unconditional statistics here for the temperature uh, and the mixture fraction, both mean and the variance, uh, here uh, over the, the radius in such a flame. And usually did such LES results we call a posteriori in comparison to a priori or prior, which I'll use in a, in a couple of minutes. So these are the standard comparisons that we uh, make. And then we say the model is good or it doesn't perform too well. Now, how do we achieve uh, this? What do we need in order to do such a simulation? Um, so turbulent combustion modeling, and this is my very subjective viewpoint here, uh, basically consists of three building blocks. We have to account for the turbulent flow and the mixing, combustion chemistry, and the turbulence chemistry interaction. And I'll just walk you through these three building blocks uh, very briefly. So turbulent flow and mixing, uh, I'm obviously talking about LES and uh, uh, here uh, zooming in into our flow field, you know that with the current bridge resolution that we have, we can resolve the significant part of our turbulent motions here. Uh, these are the eddies in black, but you still, we still have to model a lot of smaller eddies uh, shown here in red. And if you want to take the, uh, the point of view of a turbulent spectrum, uh, this would be the part approximately that we, um, that we have to uh, resolve. And that is the part we have to uh, model. And I, I, I note that this is, of course, a slightly oversimplified presentation, but I think it's sufficient uh, for the purpose here. Now, then we have in these jet flames, we always have to worry about our intake uh, inlet flow. And uh, what we usually do is we do a turbulent inflow condition from uh, a pre-calculation here. It's a pipe uh, where we inject our turbulent structures from this pipe calculation here at the end. So that's the turbulent flow and mixing. Part. Now, how do we do with the chemistry and uh, how do we go along here? And I'll just um, take the, the point of view of someone who is uh, familiar with flamelet modeling. Uh, so the, the typical approach in flamelet modeling is that we say we have premixed flames, we have non-premixed flames, you see here the flame sheet and which um, scalars align with this flame sheet, which is for example, the progress variable and the temperature in the premixed flame and the mixture fraction uh, gradient here in the non premix part. So these are structures and indicated here by the uh, green line. That's what be the flamelet. And we need to know on where we have a reaction zone, we need to know this uh, flamelet structure. How do I bring this knowledge into uh, a simulation? And I'll take uh, just the example of a premix flame. You see here again the generic burn stabilized premix flame. And if you would plot uh, again over physical space the flame structure, you will see the oxidizer and the fuel um, being consumed as you go through along the flame. The temperature is increasing. The products here in blue are increasing. And the dashed black line is the heat release rate. Overall, uh, you have a thermochemical state from this 1D flame. Thermochemical state here indicated by phi, which is the scalars, uh, mass fraction, and the temperature. You can form what we call a progress variable, which is monotonically increasing as you go down the flame. And um, just replotting the same thing is you just plot, don't plot it over physical space, but you plot it over progress variable. And you see for the progress variable being zero, you're in the unburned range and the progress variable being at maximum, you're approaching the post oxidation uh, zone uh, close to equilibrium. So everything will be parameterized by this progress variable. 
And you do not, you don't do this only for one mixture fraction or equivalence ratio. You do usually do this for many within the flammability limits. And you see this plotted here. So one flame is going here for a certain, uh, for a certain equivalence ratio, mixture fraction here from zero to the maximum value. And this is how we build a, a flamelet manifold, which is a low dimensional manifold parameterized by the mixture fraction and the progress variable, giving us then with these two variables, the full entire thermochemical state. We store this in a table, which we sometimes call FLUT, flame lookup table, and I'll use this abbreviation uh, here as well. So how do we do this in the LES? The LES then solves the equations for uh, mixture fraction and uh, progress variable, goes into the flame tabulation and gets the rest of the thermochemical state for which we don't solve equations and brings it back to the LES. All of this obviously has to be coupled with uh, a turbulence chemistry interaction model because uh, there are unresolved parts. And uh, I just mentioned results that you're seeing later on are either uh, obtained with a presumed probability density function approach or an artificial thick and flame. Unfortunately, I don't have to go, I don't have the time to go in all the details here. Now, taking this into account, I can explain you what we mean by a prior analysis. Here, we really want to combine experimental data and modeling assumptions. Now, let's look a little bit closer at this multi-regime burner that I talked about several times already. Now, it's a burner where you have a central jet of uh, premixed fuel and air. It's usually rich. You see here 1.8, 2.6 equivalence ratio. You have a slot one, which contains air, in a slot two, which is a premixed fuel air mixture, year five, one point, uh, 0.8. What you see here in this flame is an experimental figure for these two cases. Uh, this complex flow structure uh, where you have recirculation zones in this area, you have a premixed outer reaction zone from this lean reaction zone and a lifted inner reaction zone here in this, in this shear layer. And uh, as I said before, experimental data <coughs> were taken, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and especially here we have Raman Rayleigh and CO Liff in addition to the velocity field, which we used for uh, validation. Now, what's the concept of a prior analysis? Let, let's assume you don't even do the LES, you just have the experimental data available. So you have the experimental data, the thermochemical state, which I call here phi experimental, so all the major species and the temperature. You can form from this the two parameters that we need uh, for the flamelet here. It's the mixture fraction and the progress variable. It can be formed from these uh, variables. Then you can actually use this mixture fraction, this progress variable, and look into the flamelet lookup table. And what you get is then, again, the entire thermochemical state. And this is indicated here. So you use the experimental value to ask the flamelet table what would be the thermochemical state, which you would assume if it is a flamelet. And then you can compare actually what you really measured with what you would be predicted having the correct parameters from a flamelet table. And this is what we call a prior analysis. And this you do for each single measurement, and then you can do conditional statistics. And this is really shown here on the right side at three different lines in this flame. So very close to the nozzle and further downstream. And please just look here at the experiment. You see the mixture fraction, the progress variable, and color coded is the temperature. And this is what you get. You get close to the um, stoichiometric mixture fraction, get the maximum temperatures as you would expect. And uh, already here, you see the accessible space in this composition uh, space uh, way of plotting things. And then you can compare to what would happen if you put a non-premixed flamelet in here. So this is the, uh, the, the same uh, data, but with assumption of a non-premixed flame and a premixed flame. So what you see here that the differences are fairly small. So this particular case is not very sensitive when it comes to the temperature on the assumption of the reaction zone that you make here, whether it's premixed or non-premixed. That changes dramatically if you look at CO, and here you see the same thing for CO. And then you see two things. First of all, neither the premixed nor the non premixed flamelet lookup table can recover the experimental signal. And um, obviously, here CO is very regime sensitive, and neither of the asymptotic limits is very good in predicting 
the CO uh, accurately. So summing that up, the temperature and the major species are captured by the tabulation strategy, problems in prediction of CO, and we cannot say anything about the combustion regime as of now. And CO is known to be sensitive to the local combustion regime and mode. And remember, I have not done an LES yet. I just looked at <clears throat> what kind of uh, flamelet uh, could be suitable for that type of uh, flame. So the question is really, are these deviations related to the local combustion regime? So how do we get to the combustion regime? And this is the third part in this computing on the signal I would like to um, talk about, is how can we use the experimental data, later on also the numerical data, to determine the local combustion mode. Now, recalling uh, what we get from a Raman Rayleigh measurement here is along a line, the flame is indicated here, you would get along this line the distributions of the main species here as a mole fraction and the temperature. Shown here schematically is methane, CO2, and O2. Now, this is what we have. And then we form, can we? Can we determine the regime from this information? And we, uh, some time ago, we made four hypotheses, and these are shown here. So the major species and the temperature from the experiment are a footprint of the thermochemical state and the combustion regime. So that's hypothesis one. Then we said we can approximate from this the full thermochemical state by uh, a simulation, a constraint zero D simulation. Then we can compute relevant flame markers, and I come to this in a second, from the state. And combining these flame markers can tell us where the reaction zone is and what kind of reaction zone it is. Now, the main flame markers I'd like to talk about are the Bilger mixture fraction, which you already can compute without approximation. The second one is the chemical explosive mode, and the third one is the heat release rate. Well, the first and the third are probably uh, pretty clear, the chemical explosive mode. Let me just briefly explain that to you um, if you're not so familiar with this quantity. That, is, um, that can be computed from the eigenvalues of the chemical Jacobian. So you take the local thermochemical state, compute the chemical Jacobian, perform an eigenvalue analysis, and then you get the chemical explosive mode. Obviously, you need the uh, thermochemical state for this. Why is this important? Many, um, there is a procedure which is called CIMA, chemical explosive mode analysis. And they showed that the chemical explosive mode, and you see here a sample plot, goes from a positive value here in green to a negative value uh, rapidly. And that is a good indication for a premixed flame or auto ignition. So that was known from the literature. So I show you here plots of these flame markers along one Rayleigh line. And this is really from an experiment. So you see the chemical explosive mode in green, the, uh, the mixture fraction here in orange, in, uh, and uh, the heat release rate uh, here in black, uh, and the temperature here in gray. What we see here is that you have a so-called zero crossing from positive to negative in the chemical mode, exactly at the point where we predict also in this region of interest here in gray, the heat release rate. So obviously what we found here is a premixed structure in our, uh, along this line. Now let's look at the second example. We see here again a zero crossing, but there is no appreciable heat release, just a little bit. Really the heat release takes part in a region which is very close to stoichiometric mixture. And that means that in this region of negative mode, uh, chemical mode, really have something that is closer to a non-premixed structure. So these would be closer to the asymptotic limits. But what we find actually in multi-regime combustion is that we had, remember um, the, the definition before, diffusion-like reaction zones and premixed propagating layers in close proximity. And this is really what we see in these examples. So we see a zero crossing here with an appreciable heat release, but we also see a second heat release peak here in a region of negative mode and close to stoichiometric uh, mixture. So what we really have here is a premixed and a non-premixed flame very close to each other, with the premix flame being the dominant one. And here, they're just the opposite. We have a zero crossing, a little bit of heat release. This is a premix flame or stratified flame, and the heat release in the very close to stoichiometric mixture. So here we have a multi regime structure, which is, however, dominated by a non premix flame. So this is what we really call um, this multi regime structures. 
And what we actually did after that is we formulated a flame regime parameter for these uh, cases. And depending on the heat release in the premix and the non-premix part, normalizing it with the maximum value, we could uh, actually come up with six different regimes from premix, dominantly premix, multi-regime, dominantly premix, non-premix, and lean back supported. Now the question is, well, we do this on a single line, but we have hundreds and thousands of Raman lines, Raman Rayleigh lines, and then we can actually come up with what we call a regime map. And this is shown here. Um, and you see, as you go downstream, which is shown here, you see the relative distribution of different uh, regime uh, as you go downstream. And you really start from premix flames, go to dominant premix, and a large region, which is really this part here, where you have this lifted flame. And this is a really multi regime structures. So that gave us a lot of insight into the flame. And brief, a little bit later, I'll talk about whether we can recover this in the simulation or not. Now, um, I, I fully uh, know that this um, is, was probably way too short to explain you the approach. I want to just give you the, a little bit on the history, how we developed this over the last couple of years. So we started out in 2018, where we showed that on, on a mildly lifted, uh, mildly turbulent lifted flame, we can uh, introduce this uh, gradient-free regime identification I just talked about. And we applied it to experimental and numerical data. When we saw that the, the chemical explosive mode and where it appears gives us more information um, on the strength of the heat release, then we validated this approach on DNS data actually uh, for turbulent high Karlovitz flames. Then um, with this knowledge, we went to this multi-regime burner and this is just what I showed you before, this regime maps and the prior analysis. Then we also saw that we can actually train convolutional neural networks for regime detection on this information. And uh, finally, we applied this to the second multi-regime burner from the TNF workshop, which is the inhomogeneous jet flame with local extinction and reignition. And again, also we could find these extinction and reignition events on the Raman Rayleigh lines and uh, combine this with the flame markers. Now, after having done this, the real question is, I'm a simulation person, can we use this in LES of complex turbulent flames? And this is what I'm um, talking about next. Now I'm coming to my last part, which is the examples and uh, uh, the uh, three LES applications that are announced earlier. And let me start again uh, or continue with this multi-regime multi-mode burner. All of this I've shown before. So this is just a reminder. So this is the Darmstadt multi-regime burner. We have this regime maps showing the complexity of this flame. And now when we go to the LES, um, really two questions. Are we able to predict the experimental observations in terms of the scalars that we directly get? And are we able to predict the local combustion mode? So these are the two things I want to talk about. And you see here instantaneous flame snapshot. And uh, I just took uh, two examples for the velocity and the mixture fraction. Uh, many more are uh, published, but uh, this is what we get, uh, a fairly good agreement uh, for the mean and the uh, uh, variance, the RMS values. Um, overall, we said we get the flow field and the mixing dynamics captured quite well. And uh, then we went on and said, okay, let's, let's look and we now perform the same regime identification on the simulated data. So similar like we did uh, on the experimental data, we just used the predicted thermochemical state from the simulation on a single snapshot and then did the regime analysis. And I think that reveals quite some interesting features. You see again, color coded the different regimes going from this lean back supported to the non premix flames to the premix flames. And in green, you always want to look for this motor regime part. You see here these outer uh, premix and dominantly slightly stratified premix flames. You remember there was a lean premix flame, so this is detected quite nicely. But here in this region, in this lifted flame part, you see a lot of multi-regime structures with pockets of non-premix flames. And um, this lean back support from the recirculation of the hot gases. Now, this was the experiment that I showed you before, the regime map that we get here. And then we use the same um, approach. And then we said, are we predicting the same regimes in our simulation here? And uh, what you see here, overall, the agreement is, is quite okay. 
But you obviously see in these regions that the agreement uh, can be improved. And uh, what it actually comes down to is that uh, the mixing is not, uh, uh, the, the mixing prediction has some deficiencies here. And uh, it also guides us where we need to improve the combustion model. But obviously, now we really know where to look in the combustion model development because we really know where the combustion model failed. So summary for that part would be that the complexity of the flame can be recovered uh, in the LES and the benefit for model evaluation and development is really that we now have a quantitative measure for the combustion regime and the mode of the reaction zone. And we really can say that we get in, in the best case, the right answer for the right reason. And not just because we have error accumulation in an LES and uh, get a favorable uh, comparison uh, to the data. Now let's uh, go to the second example. It's a, a gas turbine combustor. Uh, and I briefly mentioned this before. This is a test trick at the last Stuttgart. It's a swell stabilized flame running overall lean. Um, you see the, um, the, the setup here. And um, the experimental data is also mentioned here. It includes Raman scattering to which we could compare. Um, what we are looking for is a thermoacoustically instable case. And I'll just briefly show you a video, hopefully summarizing all of the features that we're looking at. So obviously we had to create a mesh and then you see some of the dynamics. So it's obviously um, an oscillating flame uh, due to the swirling inlets. Um, indicated by the background color is the pressure oscillation from the instability and um, the precessing core, the vortex core is indicated here. All of this leads to a thermoacoustic uh, oscillation, which is uh, um, convection and mixing uh, dominate. Now, um, first, first thing we did is compared to the experimental data, we had temperatures, uh, species CO2, CH4, H2O, uh, that gave a uh, reasonable agreement here uh, on these uh, lines as you see them here. And we also saw that the pressure amplitude over here shown over the frequency um, gets uh, the, the right peak. So this is uh, in line what other people have predicted uh, for this particular case. So we were quite happy with the overall simulation. And then we said, let's go to the regime. Now you see a snapshot from the simulation. And again, same color coded from premix to non premix. Again, look for the green if you want to see multi regime over one thermoacoustic cycle. And you see here how these multi regime parts develop, then flushed out and you see the complexity of this flame uh, during this instable uh, combustion process. And um, we, uh, I, I want to show you three different time instances here, uh, T1, T2, T3. And you really see here in the first instance in this, um, where we have an accumulation of uh, richer pockets, you see this V flame with multi-regime structures. As you go, as the combustion progresses, the flame lifts off by excess air, and that basically appears in a, a premix combustion pockets of multi regime, which you see here. And then the pro flame propagates again towards the inlet, and then you see mostly uh, premix reaction forms. So, again, it gives us a lot of information on the dynamics of the flame, which we didn't have before, which can now be obtained from the simulation and um, or can also explain if a certain as um, comparison to experiment is not favorable, where to look? So, which goes beyond a standard comparison of, of individual scalars without knowing what's the combustion regime. Now, let me, let me, let me close my talk, um, summarizing uh, what I said about computing the signal. So what we really try is here, we leverage the availability of the thought thermochemical state in 3D simulation to obtain a more direct comp comparison with the observables from the experiment, which could be OH lift from aldehyde lift or the Schlieren signal. That is advantageous for, um, for non-quantitative signals. We reduce the post-processing uncertainty for in challenging environments. And we see also a reduced risk of error accumulation and compensation. And I put this very blank, uh, blank and bluntly out here, just because the LES and the experiment give similar results, it does not mean that the model is accurate. So um, I, I want to uh, be cautious here. So we need probably more measures for comparison to make sure that everything is right. Now, the second thing was, how can we go towards the combustion regime and learn a little bit more from the experiments as we did before? I introduced a prior analysis um, where in case of manifold based methods, so that could be flame that read or similar. 
uh, we could uh, compare to the quantitative data measurements directly and see uh, without doing an LES whether we're on the right track. I introduced uh, a REAM identification method, which is applicable to experimental and numerical data, and it does not need 3D gradients. And both methods were applied uh, to a multitude of flames, and that gives us deeper insights into the flame structures here. And I, what I actually honestly believe is that we have new measures uh, available now for comparing the microstructure of turbulent flames, which goes beyond to what we had before. Now, having all this, the question is, where do we go from here? And what can we do now to improve our workflow, so to say? Now, let's look uh, and uh, what's, the, what's my takeaway message, so to say? So think about experiments and simulation working together. Now, the state of the art, you want to understand the physical of complex flames. The experiments would apply and develop diagnostic techniques. The simulation would look at model development and highly resolved simulations. And now coming back to the title of my thoughts, I want to go towards integrated in, uh, inference. So what can simulations provide to experiments and what experiments are needed for model development? These are really two questions we have to answer. And this needs to be done in a joint analysis of the physical processes expected to be relevant. So you don't have the flame ready and set up in the laboratory yet. And we want to uh, think about expected regimes, what are highly transient phenomena like flashback or blow off or other instabilities. Now, what can be done is that the experiment then starts in selecting the suitable diagnostics with having computing on the signal in mind that they don't have to post process everything to the very last bit, but they can say, now I can do a trade off between quantitative versus qualitative. I can rather go high speed or 2D or 3D measurements because I can use this data to directly compare to the simulation. Um, and we learn much more about the dynamics of these flames because we get simultaneous multi-scalar measurements, which might not be available otherwise. But the scalar is not the temperature or species, but it's the experimental signal. And on the simulation side, um, you wanna look at the model development, and then you can check is our model ingredient and Differential diffusion are just two examples. Are they sensitive in these various diagnostics? And that's what we did. I didn't have the time to show this, but you could show that um, in certain signals, differential diffusion can be seen and other signals it can be not seen. And um, then you can come up with quantitative diagnostics um, like Raman Rayleigh. You can go beyond the standard comparisons, regime and prior analysis. And if you have qualitative diagnostics, by combining it uh, with the, the simultaneous signals of numerical and real experiments, then offers uh, new insights uh, about the flame dynamics. And uh, with this, uh, I, I'm, thank you for, for staying with me for this very long talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's still some left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. What very great uh, presentation. It's very comprehensive and insightful. Uh, we do receive uh, uh, actually a lot of questions from audience. Uh, I will ask you on behalf of them. The first question is from Ralph Ritz from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Christian, can formaldehyde times OH be used for both premix and non premix flame to find the HRR? Yeah, well, the, um, the, the OH signal is, is very important in, in many flames. And premix, the, uh, the jet flame, the DMED jet flame, it was very important to see where the reaction layers are, so close to the stoichiometric mixture. And in the non premix flame, it's, it's a little bit uh, different here. We, we could combine it with the formaldehyde lift signal very nicely, but you know that you have a long trail in the OH uh, in, the, in the burned region. So, uh, it's really overlaying it with another signal that gives you all the information that you need. So yes, but OH is really one of the standard diagnostics that you want to have and uh, gives you also in flashback, uh, gives you uh, a lot of information or blow off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the second question is from Diego. So is the relationship between HRR and the product of uh, concentrations of radical species and our non-equilibrium species quantitative and they are, is there any hope of quantitatively connecting the two, quanti two quantities? 
The HRRO course is much more complicated because of the multiple steps, very strong nonlinear dependence on temperature. Well, um, that, that's a tough one. And, and maybe I have to, um, uh, I just realized I didn't answer Rolf's question uh, completely. So uh, the correlation of formaldehyde and OH is, is only usable for the heat release rate. Uh, for us, it was only in premix flames. So for non premix, it didn't work so nicely. Um, but coming back to the other question, um, well, um, overall, what you have to keep in mind is that these lift signals, and this is something I learned, you remember, I'm not an experimentalist, um, is that there are only a few lift signals that you can make quantitative. OH is one, but it takes, uh, it's a long road because you, may, uh, you know which uh, quenching corrections you can take and uh, uh, temperature measurements you need. Now, um, I think Getting it quantitative, and we showed that uh, you can get OH quantitative, it helps, but the other species we might not get quantitative. The correlation, we always um, were good in normalizing it to the main, uh, to the maximum value. And that means that uh, that was sufficient information for us. So I wouldn't put up my hopes to get uh, the heat release rate measured in a quantitative manner, unless you have at least OH and Raman Rayleigh. Um, what we needed to get quantitative uh, heat release rate from an experiment was Raman Rayleigh and quantitative OH. So that is pretty far out. So I'd say that that's probably not happening, but the uh, not immediately at least, but um, the correlations, if you normalize them properly and use numerical information was sufficient and uh, that's actually all we needed to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So the next question is from Professor Zenton. So is your simulation of DME air flame interacting with wall, did you consider low temperature chemistry? Could you please comment on the effects of low temperature chemistry on flame wall interaction at the normal and the engine conditions? Yeah. Uh, a very good question. Uh, that, that's that's a very interesting thing, and that kept us busy for quite a while. Um, the the simulations that I showed did not consider low temperature chemistry, but we did this for a good reason. Um, we well, at least hope so. Uh, we actually uh, looked at this very um, very in, in much detail before in this uh, sidewall quenching burner, um, and we we saw that the low temperature chemistry actually for the conditions we looked at has only a very small amount. You could see this in the reaction path analysis, but overall for all these things like heat release rate, quenching distances, uh, these more global quantities, it didn't have a lot of effect. It even didn't um, affect the formaldehyde profile too much. Um, they, 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 we have a lot, uh, we have a detailed study on this uh, and it was surprising for us, but the low temperature chemistry at the wall for the conditions we looked at didn't play a major role. And uh, mm -hmm. then we reduced the mechanism uh, together with um, uh, Alessandro Stani from uh, Milan. And then uh, we used that mechanism in this highly resolved simulation because uh, we needed a smaller mechanism. So there was uh, 26 species in the end. Okay, good. So next question is from Todd Fansler. Thanks Christian for a very interesting presentations. Com uh, computing the signal is clearly a powerful approach. What level of detail do you implore in computing the e experimental signal? For example, leaf can depend strongly on the local environment through temperature. So my impression is that OH star, which is often used in high speed image, is also a challenge to compute. Do you have data or models for, for OH star signal? Um, okay, uh, let me start with the first part. Uh, uh, talk, thanks for the question. That's uh, obviously um, a challenge. And um, as I said before, OH lift, we, we did have, if you choose the right uh, transition and the uh, right wavelength, you can, we have uh, good information and we know uh, the Boltzmann part, the quenching part, and, and all these things can be accounted for. Uh, it has become way more complex uh, for formaldehyde. And in, in this particular case, we worked very closely with Jonathan Frank uh, from Sandia, who did some uh, calculations uh, how to compute in, uh, the uh, formaldehyde lift signal and what's the 
uh, temperature dependency on this, but all of this was included to a certain degree. Um, collisional quenching uh, was a little bit more complex for this, but yes, the uh, PAH is out of the question. And so actually you have to calibrate this uh, uh, based on dedicated experiments in my opinion. So um, OH star is another thing. Um, we did this several times, but chemiluminescence to get chemiluminescence right there are two ingredients. First of all, you need to do ray tracing, uh, proper ray tracing, uh, and you need to have a good OH star mechanism. Um, I think both are, well, the, the ray tracing is just computationally expensive. The OH star, I'm not sure if in all the cases uh, we have a proper mechanism. We tried it several times and the results, at least for us, were not totally convincing, but I could, uh, I cannot tell you whether it was the OH star mechanism or our ray tracing. Uh, so there is a lot to be learned. So a simple technique like OH star chemiluminescence gives us a lot of headache in the post-processing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Next question is from Professor Tai Jin from Zhejiang University. Thanks, Professor. The multi-region concept is quite useful for uh, recognition of microstructure as well as better modeling. However, the identification is very difficult, especially for complex field. Is there a multi-region for low temperature chemistry or low temperature combustion process? Yes, there is. And um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't have the time to go into all the details here, but um, when you look at the spray flames at the very end, uh, you can show that this multi-regime identification was specifically extended to account for the low temperature chemistry. And you, um, you can see, well, th this is part of the uh, identification and there you need the, uh, the chemical explosive mode is, uh, is very instrumental because it tells you about the ignition process. You can do it, it's not uh, straightforward, but you can show again, going from simple to more complex flames that this regime identification can include LTC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, there is a follow-up question from Todd Fansler. For spray flame, what level of details about the spray do you employ, like the atomization model for compute um, signal? Well, you thought you always know where to hit the weak spot of people who are doing multi-phase spray flame. Uh, well, obviously, uh, breakup modeling, and I've been doing this for <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm more than 20 years now, actually, that... Uh, Makes me wonder about my age now. Um, well, breakup modeling is, is more an art than a science sometimes. And uh, we usually do uh, primary and secondary breakup modeling, but these are not predictive per se. We always need experimental data to make sure that we hit the right, uh, say, the spray shape and uh, we get the right droplet size distribution. Because if we don't have the right droplet size distribution, we don't get the uh, correct prediction of the mixture fraction. And uh, yes, but. Uh, Yes, we do break up modeling in here, standard approaches, uh, and uh, all of them have, however, been evaluated and compared to experimental data, which fortunately are available in the engine combustion network, which is a, a very good place if you want to learn about uh, modeling and simulation, uh, how you need to adjust these things. Okay, good. So th there is a comment from the Professor Diego. Uh, he commented that the transient spectral uh, infrared radiation signal is a really good metric for matching the microstructure and the macrostructure of flame in combustor as well. Also, a very important additional consideration must be bias uh, uncertainty syst systematic and the ra uh, random noise as well. Okay, this is comments yeah. from Diego. Very good, uh, Jay. Uh, thanks for, for bringing this up. Uh, Certainly, this is this is very important, and I think it goes immediately in the direction where I'm heading. And uh, certainly, this is something for for future considerations. Uh, and I totally agree that bias, uncertainty, systematic, and random noise needs to be included as well. And in fact, again, I didn't have time to show this, but uh, one of the first studies we did is we tried to compute uh, a Rayleigh signal and. Um, Actually, what needed to be done in order to make this reliable is we needed a lot of measurements for background, stray light, and, and similar things. So actually, what you cannot do, and probably I, I should have said that very explicitly, is that you cannot just go ahead and compute the signal. Actually, what you need to do is you there are multiple measurements which are not in the flame environment uh, where you have to uh, quantify 
like for example stray light or background uh, scatter um, that you make sure because you need to normalize put this in the normalization procedure so there there is a longer path of things you have to do in order to uh, to get this comparison right it's like calibrating the measurement you actually have to calibrate the computed signal as well it's uh, maybe I, I oversimplified it uh, due to time constraints, but thanks for bringing this up. Uh, no, no, I didn't mean to uh, bring this up as uh, you know any any type of criticism or uh, suggesting that you oversimplify. I just brought it up as uh, knowledge for all of us to remember. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks for uh, giving me the chance. Thank you. To say uh, great talk, by the way, Christian. Yeah, great talk. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, both. So the next question is from Professor Dong Yang from SASTEC. Many thanks for the very nice presentation. On slide uh, 15, uh, 57, I may have just missed what's the feel here. Actually, this is a machine. Would you please also comment on how different the multi-region combustion effect would be for different fuels, such as machine hydrogen and ammonia? Yeah, uh, yes, it was methane. And uh, as you know, there are uh, similar measurements coming up now with uh, methane hydrogen mixtures, uh, sometimes with uh, also including of uh, ammonia. Um, yeah, and it, actually, this is what I said on my, uh, I think my first slide is that what will happen is that multi regime will become more prominent. Why? Because these fuels have extremely different combustion characteristics. You might, you know, that ammonia is very inert. You might have some reforming first to H2. H2 is very reactive, but also very diffusive. What actually happens is <clears throat> you get inner stratification by differential diffusion. And then just assume a, a close to stoichiometric flame where you have by differential diffusion, you get a stratification, you get a leaner part and a, a richer part, and they both burn in, in premixed modes and then the combustion products go into a, a, a small a diffusion flame or non-premixed zone. So what will happen is due to the differences in reactivity, the differences in diffusivities, the local reaction zone structure becomes more complex, it becomes stratified at its inner core and that means that we have more appearances of multiple reaction zones in close proximity. So I think that's quite exciting for the uh, next couple of years for us. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to look at all of these cases uh, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Great. So we also have uh, one comment from Dr. Hosen on the one response from Todd Fonsela. Due to limited time, we, we cannot cover this comment on the, on the response. Okay, if there is no further questions from audience, uh, thank you, Christian, again. Also, thank, yep. thank you everyone for joining the combustion webinar today.